the image of God. The image of God and and I want to give honor and credit to the young man that helped me put this study guide together. Kareem Flowers. Come on. Uh, hallelujah. And he did a lot more than typesetting. He helped with the message itself. Glory to God. Chapter 1. Knowing the will of God. I put this first so that if we can accomplish, if we can accomplish this chapter, we can move forward. Isn't that right? We can move forward. Knowing the will of God. There's a verse in chap, um, chapter 3 of Mark, verse 35 says, For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. Whosoever shall do the will of God is in the family of God. That's what he's saying. Are you hearing God? I've been instructed by the Lord to do an expository of the New Testament. Normally, one would start such a task with the four Gospels. That's normal. And God tell you to, to do a commentary on the, on the New Testament. You, most people start with the four Gospels. Or at least the book of Romans. <clears throat> but I chose to start in the book of Colossians. Mainly because it's a short book. Very short, it's only four chapters, bless the Lord. But little did I know that it was the Lord leading me to start there. He said, the book of Colossians, listen to the Lord now. The book of Colossians is the hub of the New Testament. I don't know about you, but God speaks to me in language that I can understand. Because I understand hub, and some of you that you know, familiar with airlines and airports, you know, there, if there's a hub, that's where all the planes come in at, amen, to do their exchanges. Suddenly, look at this, the thought of doing an expository became more and more exciting because the Lord was, what he was really saying was that the book of Colossians holds every aspect of the mystery of Christ. Can you imagine? It holds nearly every aspect of the mystery of Christ if you study it properly. If you study it properly, you will touch on every aspect of the mystery of Christ. Colossians 1, verse 1 through verse 4. What? Uh, well, let's start here. Let's read it first. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. For those who like Timotheus, amen. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. By the will of God. What is the will of God? And how can anyone be sure that what you think is the will of God is actually the will of God? Have you ever thought about that? Has that question ever come across that maybe what I'm thinking to be God's will, how can I be sure that what I'm thinking is God's will is really God's will? Is that where we've been? Amen. <clears throat> This is the question the body of, is asking today. It seems that no matter how the revelation of Christ in the church unfolds, this question is, e is either on the lips or in the hearts of God's people. Either people are asking, you know, their leaders to help them understand the will of God, or it's down in their heart. 
It's down in their heart. They want to know what is the will of God. I'm not sure that what I'm doing is the will of God, or I'm not sure. I heard something, but, you know, I got something in my spirit, but I'm not sure it's God. I'm not sure God put it there. Maybe it's my own mind. Have we ever been there? Amen. Glory to God. It seems after so much revelatory knowledge, it will be easy to discern the will of God. I mean, with all this revelation we've had and all of the testimony of our spiritual growth, it seems that it would be very easy for us to understand or to know the will of God. But that has not been the case. It has not. There are many people that are still not sure, are very perplexed, amen, and some have even fallen into despair because they're not sure of what the will of God is. And um, especially when, when they're dealing with things that are crucial to their well-being. When they're dealing with things that are crucial to their well-being. I want you to prepare your hearts in the conference this weekend. And some of these chapters are very long. I want you to prepare your hearts uh, to hear the truth. And the truth is, is going to be very raw because that's how God give it. He doesn't add or take away anything from his will. He just tell you what it is. Isn't that right? Glory to God. And uh, so I want you to prepare your hearts to receive the facts about this issue, the will of God. All the promises of God are yea, aren't they? There's no contrary, contra, you say controversy, uh, but we say controversy, amen? They both mean the same thing. There's no question, no argument. Hello? Uh, about the promises of God. If God says something, it is as he said. If he promises something, he will deliver. Is that right? We can trust God to perform his word. And, and, and that's the basis for our uh, lesson tonight and for the rest of our lives. We have to know. You, you have to know there's a, there, there, is a, there must be a great expectation there must be an, an expectation that whatever you read in the scriptures, you can expect it to be performed in your life. You got to have you got to have that. If you don't have that, you can't trust this God that you're serving. How can you trust him? You got to know and see faith is knowing that what God says he will deliver. That's what faith is. Faith is without controversy. Faith says, if God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Isn't that right? Hello? Praise the Lord. So what I'm saying to you is that you've got to open your heart. If it hasn't been opened up to this point, you've got to open your heart up so that you believe that if it's written, if God says it, he will perform it. And that everything that God has promised is yea. Everything that God says he'll do, he will do it without controversy. Are you working with me? God keeps his promises even if you go in the grave. Hello? The people that went in the grave, God met them there and brought them out. They died believing in the promise of God. And he went down in the in the lower parts of the earth and brought them up because they believed, they were faithful in their belief that if God said it, he'll perform it. I remember Job saying, glory to God, when his friends were all, they were chiding with him and he said, let me tell you something, I know my redeemer, you think I'm afraid of dying? Do you, I wish I could die. I wish I could die. I'm not afraid of dying because I know my redeemer lives. And that in the last day, he will stand up and he will call my name. And when he does, I will answer. He, he, he had confidence in what God said. That's, that, that is the thing 
I, I wish, you know, I wish this was just a plain old discipleship session so I could really get down, down to, you know. But that is the thing that has really carried me all these 30 years of ministering in Bible teachers and 15 years before Bible teachers. When I got saved, when I, when I received the Holy Spirit to know that I had received it and baptized in it, glory to God, I took God's word to him. I said, your word says. And I told him what his word said. And I said, now, I'm supposed to have the Holy Spirit. And the very next day, I was overshadowed in the Holy Spirit. And ever since then, I knew that it would be blasphemy on my part to not believe God. I knew that I could always have confidence in what the words say. I could always depend on what the word says. That's why when God says something to me, I don't consult with flesh and blood. I don't go to flesh and blood and consult with them and what do you think about this? What do you think? No, I go and tell them what the Lord said. But there's not going to be a controversial discussion about it because it's over. If God said it, it's over. It's settled. So I'm saying to you that you have to have an expectation. I want you to get an expectation before I go, even before I go any further. I want you to have an expectation in your heart. I want you to open your heart up right now to say, you know what? Let me open my heart up to God. Let me just open my heart all the way up to God. Make myself, my little heart, and all of those little things that I'm trying to protect, my little emotions and my feelings. Let me, let me make myself completely vulnerable to God. Let me hear what he's going to say to me tonight. Let me really hear it with my spirit. Let me not allow my emotions to get in the way, my desires to get in the way, my unbelief to get in the way, my fear to get in the way. Let me become vulnerable to God, totally vulnerable to God. Can we do that? John 16 and 12 says, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. This is what Jesus said to his disciples when he was yet with them. You can't bear them. They were not yet born again. And he knew that he couldn't talk to them. He could really talk to them about salvation. He couldn't really explain the mystery to them. Not, all, not fully. Because he knew that as natural men, first of all, they would never understand it. They would never comprehend it as natural men. They could never comprehend God Almighty coming down to live in them. They would not under, have understood that. They not, wouldn't have believed it, even though they had the evidence right there in front of them. And, and, and uh, gosh, there's something I want to say about that, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate it. Okay, let's, let's, let's give it a try. What, would made, what, what made it impossible for them to be able to bear the mystery of Christ at that time being unsaved is because they did not understand what was before them. They did not understand what was before them. They, did, they, they saw Jesus and they, at one point Jesus asked them, say, who do people say that I am? Remember? And, and, and then they, they, you know, the prophets and all of that. But then he said, who do you say I am? And of course, one of them said, Peter said, you're the son of God. You're the son of God. 
and he, and, he, and he emphasized it. He dramatized it a little bit. He said, you're the son of the living God. Now, hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. Glory to God. We're also live on Love TV, and I want to speak to my Love TV audience tonight. Come on, let's give God a praise. Hey, come on, let's give him a praise. Come on, I can hear you, Global Conference. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Love TV will be carrying this conference, amen, from start to finish. Amen? Isn't that awesome? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we're, we're, we're all over Jamaica tonight. All over Jamaica. They could not bear the knowledge, listen to me, they could not bear the knowledge that Jesus would have taught them, if he'd have taught them about the mystery of Christ and salvation, the, the total mystery of salvation, they wouldn't have been able to bear it. They wouldn't have understood it because they did not understand what was before them. They saw Jesus, and they said to him, you're the son of God. You're the son of the living God. You're the son of the living God. But now, this is what that meant. Can I, can I use your bishop? Can I use your bishop? Isn't it so wonderful to have all my bishops here? Praise the Lord. Just about all of them. Glory to God. I got how many? One, two, three, four of them here. At five. I got five of them here. Glory to God. Whew. I'm a blessed woman. Now I got to find those others. Praise the Lord. Amen. This is what I want you to see. Jesus standing before Peter and Peter saying, you're the son of the living God. That's what Peter's saying to Jesus. But Jesus knew. Jesus knew Peter I am exactly what you will be in a few days. You didn't hear me. I am what? I am what? I didn't hear that word. Say it again. Say it. The devil don't like it, but it's. I said, the devil don't like it, but it's exactly. Peter, this is what you can't understand. You can't comprehend this now. I am the son of the living God. But in a few days, you too will be the son of the living God. And you will be exactly what I am. Because as I am, so are you. Will you see that? Do you see that? Now, the trouble that, uh, you know, that they would have had, that Jesus said, you can't bear if I tell you that now. If I tell you the truth now, you tell you the whole truth, you couldn't bear it. You're natural. You're not spiritual. You can't even comprehend that. Now, sad is sad. We know that we are born again. We know we're sons of God, but we still have not comprehended it. We, and some of us cannot bear it, cannot bear the knowledge of the truth because the truth is so bizarre when it comes to natural things. It's bizarre. When you, when you stack it up against intellect, it's very bizarre. When you, when, you, when you put it alongside logic, it's very bizarre. It doesn't make sense. It's unbelievable in the natural. It's unbelievable. What God has done in his people is unbelievable if you're a natural man. 
It's totally unbelievable. The truth is unbelievable because we're not religious people. We're not people that are just religious, going to church, glory to God, to appease our consciences. No, we've been born again. We have died and been resurrected with the power of Almighty God living in us. And that truth is unbelievable to the natural man. And in God's house, his church, his church cannot bear that truth. Theologians cannot bear that truth. They can't see it. They can't teach it. They can't preach it. So they give, they've given the body a similitude of the gospel. You've been born again. That's enough. That's all you need to know. Thank you, gentlemen. You've been born again. That's, that's, that's good enough. You've been born again, and, and, uh, you have, you've, and if you go all the way over and, and uh, become an apostolic or Pentecostal or whatever, you got the Holy Ghost. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. You got the Holy Ghost. And so that's all they told us. That's all they told us. Are y'all hearing God? Huh? I'm so excited about him. I tell you, I'm just excited about it. They could not bear it. And now the church can't bear it. And that is manifested in unbelief. God's own people that have his spirit living in them huh? are walking in unbelief. And I sound like some religious fanatic to some people. Yeah, I sound almost like heresy to some of God's own people. And that used to bother me. It used to bother me. And I used to, I'd go back to God and say, your own people don't believe you. <laughs> and God, God corrected me. He said, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. My sheep will hear me. And that's, and, 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 and that's how he encouraged me, because he took me back to Jesus, and Jesus said to the to the Pharisees, he said, if you all believe Moses, who you read every day, if you didn't believe him, you're not going to believe me. If you were, if you were of, of God, if you were really in this thing right, you would hear his son. You would hear me. You would know that I'm his son. You read about me every day and still don't know who I am because you're not of this. Come on, somebody. Your heart is not in the right place. You will never be a part of this. Because your heart's not right. You read and read and read and read and read and, and rehearse scripture. You can quote the whole Old Testament verbatim. You can quote everything up to Malachi. But let me remind you of something. Did you read the Psalms? The Psalms are about me. What the prophets wrote were about me. All the prophecies were about me. And if you were predestined to be a part of this, you would believe me. But my father know that you're not a part of this. That's why you can't hear. You can't even hear me. So, Theologians, they took us another route. You know, they, they said, okay, you got the Holy Ghost. Just calm down and it'll be all right with you. you know, that's all we needed to know. And that's all we knew because that's all they knew. That's all they were willing to know. And to know the truth, to know 
that as Jesus is, so are we. It took Jesus out of that category called uniqueness. The only thing that's unique about him was that he died for us. Come on, somebody. He died for our sins. But the Bible says he's the first of many brethren. And we are afraid. The church is afraid to let go and grab a hold of the fact that as he is, so am I. Church is afraid of that. We're, it's like we're, we're afraid to even think it, even though the scripture says it. So we don't anticipate half of the scriptures that he wrote about us. We don't anticipate walking in half of the stuff he said we're supposed to walk in. We don't anticipate walking in it. Oh, cause we, and we have an escape code. The flesh. The flesh. The flesh. Hallelujah. Are you hearing God? Okay. The master here speaks to his disciples who are not yet born again. Therefore, he realizes that they can't comprehend everything he says. They are natural men. And they wouldn't be able to bear the knowledge of God being in their natural bodies. The great God of creation is coming down from heaven to live in fellowship with them, this was inconceivable. But it was inconceivable because they were not born again. Does not the scripture say we don't even know that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost? Isn't that right? Now look at verse 13. John 16, 13 says, How be it when he, listen to this now, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth. I want everybody to read that with me. Ready? How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Do we not say all the promises of God are yea? Hello and amen? Well, now here's one right here. When the Holy Ghost comes, he will guide. He will guide. He'll guide you into the truth. Uh-oh. He'll guide you into the truth. So why are so many of God's people in ignorance? We, 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 we feel sorry for folks in other ministries and, and, and different places that, that, that don't have the truth because they're sitting, some, in some instances, they're sitting up on the, up on the places in, you know, they, they're sitting where they can't receive the truth. Amen? And we feel sorry for them. We start praying for them and whatnot. But this scripture says, when the Holy Ghost come, when he come in us, that's what he's talking about. When he come in each one of us as individuals, he will guide you to the truth. Did they say that? Promises of God are yea and? So now, should not we be anticipating, expecting the Holy Ghost to guide us to the truth? Is that not what we should be expecting? Should not that be our expectation? That if I need to know the truth, God, you're going to show me the truth. You're going to guide me. Lead and guide me to the truth. Hallelujah. When the Holy Ghost has come, they'll be able to bear this truth. It takes the Holy Ghost for us to be able to bear the truth. It is also by the Holy Spirit that we begin to understand the mystery of our salvation. When he come, we're going to have understanding. Why? Because he will come to dwell in us 
and bear witness with our own spirit that Jesus is indeed Lord. He's going to bear witness with our spirit that Jesus is Lord, with our very own spirit. The Holy Ghost is going to talk to our spirit. Oh, my God. Come on, saints. See, see, God is right here. What's the purpose of this conference, this lesson in this conference? God is right here. God is saying, I don't buy this. Don't you think you're going to sell me a bill of goods that you don't know when I'm talking to you? I am not going to leave it like that. You've been there for years. But you're going to come out of there or you're not going to know me. You're not going to know me. You're going to, you're going to miss out. Because see, the, see, see, God is, <laughs> the deep is calling the deep. There is a people that God is raising up that is a glorified church. There's a church that God is raising up that cannot be refuted. That the devil can't punch holes in their belief system. Come on, somebody. That are un unmovable, steadfast. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And God, amen, because they are unmovable, because they're steadfast, God is going to back them up. God's going to back them up. Are you hearing God? Are you, are you really hearing him? God's going to back them up. And there's going to be a people, glory to God, and we're seeing it now. We're seeing, you know, I'm seeing different ones coming to the forefront like never before. And God is like hand-picking. He's hand-picking those whose hearts are in the right place to hear him. God said, I'm not leaving it like that. Your excuse is not going to be, you don't hear me. You don't know when I'm talking to you. I, I said I would lead and guide you. So, so what, are you, what are you saying? You're saying that I don't do my job? I don't do what I said I would do? I've, I've backed off of what I said I would do? I, you, you're so way out or you're so whatever and I'm so whatever that I can't do what I said I would do? The Holy Ghost can't do? What it said, what I said he would do. Hmm? Are you hearing him? Are you hearing him? Glory to God. When the Holy Ghost come, <laughs> they'll be able to bear the truth. We'll be able to understand salvation. He's going to live in us. Now notice this. For he shall speak or not speak of himself. This is what he's saying about the Holy Spirit. He's saying the Holy Ghost will not speak of himself, but whatever he shall what? Whatever he shall what? Hear. That shall he what? Speak. And he will show you. Come on, let's read this again. For he shall not speak of himself. I need to hear everybody that's got a Bible. See, because I, I, I want heaven to know that we are alive and well down here. I say I want heaven to know that we are alive and well and we respect God down here. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear. That shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall, and he will. Isn't that what the scriptures say? He shall, and he will. He's not going to talk about himself, but whatever he hears, that he's going to speak. Question is, who is he listening to? Who is, he, who is the Holy Spirit listening to? The answer is simple. He's the spokesman for the royal family, isn't he? He's the spokesman for the royal family. Glory to God. It was the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost that first discussed, let us make man in our image. Hello. 
and in our likeness. Isn't that right? <laughs> Hello. So he's, he's, um, <laughs> he's speaking what he hears in the conversation that is going on inside of the determinant council. By the word, Holy Ghost. Jesus declares the Holy Spirit will speak to us. It is the will of the Father to speak to the sons. Now, now come on. It was the will of the, the Father that Jesus come and die for our sins, wasn't it? And he came and he died, didn't he? And guess what? No one could kill him till he got to the cross. The angels even uh, were given charge over him. And the devil said to him, said, you know what? The angels have been given charge over you. You can't even dash your foot on a stone. In other words, you can't stump your toe. Nothing can happen to you. Now, if God promised the world a Messiah, a Savior, and he was able to bring it about, people tried to stone Jesus after his first message, and they couldn't do it. He just kind of walked right through them, and they couldn't even see him. God made him, him, him invisible. The devil couldn't tempt him. Couldn't get him to sin. Nothing could stop Jesus from going to the cross. Nothing. Nothing. So if God could guarantee that his son could come down here and live among us for 33 and a half years and, and end up with no sin in him, after 33 and a half years, dwelling among sinners, he ends up with no sin, fit for the sacrifice. God guaranteed that. Don't you think he can guarantee when he say, I will lead and guide you into all truth? Huh? Are y'all hearing God? Whatever the Holy Ghost hears, that he will speak. Isn't that what the word say? He's going to speak to us the things that he hear from God, from the Father. We cannot get around that. You're not going to cut that out of the Bible. And so we need to, we need to put on brakes real quick <laughs> and say, wait a minute. If the Holy Spirit is not speaking to me, why? Since this is the will of God, it's the will of God for him to speak. So why is it that I don't know his voice? Why is it that I don't know what his will is for my life? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We can't get around it. It's ordained of God for the spirit to speak to the children of God. God ordained for his spirit to speak to us. Therefore, the problem is not with the Holy Ghost. He's not in rebellion. He's not disobeying God. Huh? That's absurd. Amen. So the source of the problem is us. It lies with us. How many people can admit the problem is me? Why do we not hear when the Spirit speaks? That's the question. Why don't we hear? Could it be that unbelief has become more powerful than the witness within us? I want you to consider that. Because just because that you're sitting here in this conference, just because you are, some of you are members of Bible teachers and you're getting all this revelation, knowledge, and all of that, hallelujah, doesn't mean that you are excluded from unbelief. Hallelujah. If so, 
What is it that many don't believe? Let's deal with this unbelief. Let's, let's go to what is it that you don't believe? Why is it so difficult? Due to the effect of, the tra of tradition and false doctrines that were fed to the body of Christ, it is almost impossible to believe that Almighty God, the one who created the universe, actually lives within us. It's almost as if the body of Christ sees the Holy Ghost as something different than God. Something other than God. Something lesser than God. Hello? Let me say that again. The body of Christ has responded to this scripture. When he comes, he will speak not only of himself, but what he hears. The body of Christ has responded to this as if, as if the Holy Ghost is something lesser than God. Something less than God. We, okay, we got the Holy Ghost. We got the Holy Ghost. We got the Holy Ghost. And we pat ourselves on the back for having the Holy Ghost. But... The scripture tells us a bunch of stuff the Holy Ghost is supposed to be doing in us. And we don't give a, we don't give a, cre we don't give any credence to why he's not doing it. Why, why is he not doing it? Why, 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 why? And when we talk about the Holy Ghost, we, we don't talk about the Holy Ghost as if he's God. But the Bible does. In fact, Jesus said, you can call me whatever you want to call me, Beelzebub and all of that. But don't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Don't blaspheme the Holy Ghost because if you do, there's no forgiveness in this world nor in the world to come. So he's not treating the Holy Spirit as if he's less than God. Because he is God. Is that right? He is God. But the church has treated the Holy Spirit as if he's something less than God. Whatever the Holy Spirit hears, he's going to speak. That's what God said in that verse. We cannot get around it as ordained of God, right? All right. It is almost impossible to believe that Almighty God actually lives in us. Thus, it is also impossible, if it's impossible for you to believe that the Holy Ghost is the fullness of God, the fullness of the Godhead bodily inside of you, if, you, if it's impossible for you to really grasp that and believe it, then it's impossible for you to fellowship with God. That's impossible. It's impossible. Unbelief will not allow you to fellowship with God. You got to believe on him the way the scriptures say. Not to just say, I'm a son of God. Just because people say we're the sons of God. Just because, amen, you come to church and the preacher say, we've been saved, so we're the sons of God. And you go around testifying, I'm a son of God. How do you, how you know you're a son of God? Well, my life been changed. I, I, I've been changed. And that's all you, you can relate to being a son of God, that your life will change. You don't go to bars no more. You don't drink no more. You don't smoke no more. You don't cuss no more. You don't fornicate no anymore. You don't lie. You don't steal. I hope not. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. You don't dip. You don't flip. You don't whatever. If that's all you can relate to. And we, and we glad about that. We glad about we don't do those things. But see, I need more than that. I need to know, I need to know, even if I don't know where I'm going, guide me. I don't have, you don't have to tell me where I'm going, just guide me to get there. Don't leave me to figure out where I'm going. Don't leave it to me to, to figure out which way to go. Or what do I do here? What do I do there? Don't leave that to me. I don't want, no, no, that ain't fair. Don't do, don't do that. Don't do that. I need more than just knowing that I'm saved. Because I got to live. 
I got to live in this world. You, didn't, you haven't taken me out of this world. I need to know how to move inside of this world. I need to know what do you expect from me? What do you expect from me now, these years that you've left me in this hostile environment? You know, you say you're leaving me like sheep among wolves. Well, I need to know how to maneuver around those wolves. I need to know how to, how, how to, how to conduct myself. I need to know which way to go, what to do. I don't want to waste my time doing stuff that you didn't ordain. And I don't want to be frustrated, perplexed. Hello? Simply because I, my daddy, my father, the one that said he would lead and guide me, I can't hear nothing from him. Can't hear anything. Woo-wee. Anybody hearing God yet? Hallelujah. Tradition. Beliefs. Traditional beliefs have made the word of God of none effect. That's what Jesus said. Didn't he say something about tradition? Make sure your traditions have made the word of God of none effect. Our traditional beliefs, even though, you see, some of us were sitting in dead works, and some of us were in a live work dead. The work was alive, but we were dead. We picked up a traditional mindset because tradition doesn't expect to be gods to this world. Uh oh, I went and said it. I went and said it. I'm out there now. Gods to this world? Gods. If, if, if you are sons of God and your father is a God, then what are you? See, see how the devil, he got you scared to even say it. Praise <laughs> Jesus. You're scared. You're scared. And, and, and Jesus, Jesus was talking to the, to the, to the Pharisees and he said, Did, is not it even written in your law that, I, that God himself has said ye are gods? And the children of the Most High, Psalms 82. Your children of the Most High, you are gods. He said, eat, didn't, eat, didn't, didn't you read that in the Psalms? Huh? So why are you upset because I say I'm the son of God? When God said, all of you that, <laughs> Lord Jesus. There you go, Dr. Banks. You done. Declare people gods now. Oh, they, oh, they a bunch of, BT is a bunch of gods walking the earth. Well, let me, let me just give, give them enough evidence to crucify me then. We are gods walking the earth. Hello? If God could say to Moses, I'm going to make you a God to Pharaoh. How much more has he said to his own children? You are gods and the sons of the most high. Why is that so hard to believe? That's not blasphemy. That's truth. That's truth that tradition Traditional mindsets, traditional huh, beliefs have forbidden us to even think. Because we've been taught that, you know, you say something like that, you're exalting yourself. That's pride. That's, that's arrogance. I'm not arrogant. I'm not full of pride. I'm just speaking the truth. If my daddy is a God, what am I going to be but what he is? Come on now. Huh? 
Oh, you think I'm not a God because it does not yet appear what I shall be in the, in the body. <laughs> huh? My body hasn't changed yet to my glorified body. Well, let me tell you something, devil. Let me tell you something. Keep watching the sons. Continue to watch the sons of God. You want to find out if there's any gods in this world? Continue to watch the real sons of God. You're going to see the sons of God do some things that Jesus didn't even do. Because he's finishing his ministry through us. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Three and a half years wasn't enough. You're going to see Jesus do some miraculous things, glory to God, and he's, he's not going to even look like that one 2,000 years ago. He's going to look like this, this, here, this here woman they called Therese. He's going to look like this woman they called Dunn. He's going to look like this man called French. He's going to look like this man called Marvin. He's going to look different, but he's going to do great and marvelous things. Somebody say, how do I get in on that? I want to be a part of that. What does it take to be a part of that? You know what God say? Just believe God. Believe it. Just believe God. Open your heart. And believe what he has said about you. You don't have to be arrogant. You don't have to be full of pride to believe what God has said about you. Because number one, when you really believe what God has said about you, it humbles you. It humbles you. It doesn't make you full of pride. It humbles us. You got to believe. What God has said. Are you working with me? It is desire of the Lord to speak to his people. But again, why is it so difficult for the church to grasp it? If the body of Christ truly believed that Jesus Christ is living in their fleshy bodies as a new man, it would be much easier to believe that the new man wants to fellowship with them. See, that's, that's the root of it. Let me show you the root of it. The root of it is people don't believe. See, because you, you have um, a soul. You have a soul. And your soul is where your memory is of the past and your desires and your likes and your dislikes, your wants, your appetites, it's all in the soul. And because the soul says, I'm tired, I'm going to lay this body down. And because the soul says, I want to eat some fried dumplings. But I know they're fattening. But I'm going to eat them anyhow. And so we eat them. And we start gaining weight and stuff. And the soul says, I want to buy this thing over here, but I really can't afford it. But we buy it anyway. The soul. Living out his desires through this body. And because the soul has, has been so undisciplined, so undisciplined and so disrespectful of God that's living in it, in this flesh, so disrespectful of the fact that this body belongs to God, so disrespectful and disregarding of the fact that this flesh, my body, is the new man 
This is Jesus living in me. That life that I'm living is not I that live any longer in the flesh. It's him. He lives in the flesh. I live in the spirit. He living in my body. Hello? He's living in my body. I'm living in his spirit. And because we have disrespected that so long, we don't see this as the new man. This thing we see in the mirror couldn't possibly be Jesus. You mean when I look in the mirror, I, I'm supposed to see Jesus? That's who I'm looking at, Jesus, in the flesh again. Jesus Christ is in the flesh again. He's in my flesh now. That's who, I'm, that's who I see in the mirror. But because I've been so undisciplined, so untemperate, or whatever that word is, a lack of temperance, hmm? intemperate, intemperate. See, I got all of these Learn it, help us here. Praise you, Jesus. Because I have not respected or regarded him as the new man, how could I think that this new man wants to fellowship with me? Because that's the person I'm looking at in the mirror. I call that me. I forget that I'm just a steward. And the reason, the reason that I'm so, in, so intemperate is because he is not a usurper. He doesn't force his will on me because him living in me is a trial for me. It's a test for me to see if I will obey God and allow him to live his life through me. But looking at that thing in the mirror, I see Mary. I don't see Jesus. So if I only see Mary, see, that's what the scripture was trying to tell us when it said, we just like a man that stood up in front of a mirror, saw himself in the, in the mirror. He saw the glory of God in the mirror. But then he turned around and walked away from the mirror and forgot what he had seen. Yeah, yeah, right. That's it. You forgot that that's what you were looking at. Yeah. Huh? Glory of God. Because it's your face. You think it's your face. That's Jesus. It's Jesus. And that Jesus that's in your, in your, living in your body, he wants to fellowship. He wants to fellowship. The prayer was, our Father, which art in heaven, I, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Kingdom has already come. Where is it? It's peace and joy and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. And where's the Holy Ghost? In us. So all that God is has come down to be in us. -wee. So if you don't believe that Almighty God has come down in the form of the Holy Ghost to be in you, then how do you fellowship with him? You don't believe he wants to fellowship with you. You don't believe you can fellowship with him because you don't really believe he's in you. Not Almighty God. There's something in you. The, you know, some spirit that calls you to change. You call it the Holy Ghost, and it calls you to change, but that's it. You don't even relate that to what it really is. Come on, saints. Am I in the house or am I in the house? All right, First John 1. 1 John 1, I think that's where we are. 
Yes. The third verse. That which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly the fellowship is, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus. Now, wait a minute. Now, this is John, the youngest apostle, and he's saying, our fellowship, me and the other apostles, we are fellowshipping with God and Jesus. That's who we fellowship with. And he said, we desire that you have fellowship with us because our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. He's fellowshipping. Here these apostles are walking the earth. This man is in prison. Glory to God. He's doing all kinds of things and walking around preaching the gospel and, and they doing all this stuff. But he says, I am in fellowship with the Father and the Son. I am in fellowship. 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 We are fellowshipping. So now, what is the church doing with that? The church is keeping that isolated to the, the disciples. The church is keeping that, oh, that was John, and that was, that was Peter, and James, and all the disciples, glory to God. But that is for the church. All of the sons are supposed to have fellowship with their father. How are you going to be in a family, and every, only a few of the kids in the family can talk to God, can talk to their daddy? And he only speaks to some of the children that live in the house. Come on. You think God is like that? He said, I'm not a respectful person. I want to speak to everybody. Come on, raise your hand and say, God, speak to me. Please speak to me, Father. Before it's over, he's going to. The best, best word to define fellowship is communication. That's the best word to define fellowship, communication. And these things write we unto you that your joy might be what? Full. It's not happy. I'm not happy when I can't hear from God. And I, didn't, and I said this to God when I first got saved. I don't believe every time I need to hear from you, I got to go find a preacher. I don't believe that. I believe that if I'm your child, you should be able to talk directly to me. This is how preachers have gained so much control in folks' lives. People have begun to depend on the preacher to talk for them, the preacher to tell them the will of God. No, I want my father to tell me his own will. Come on. You shouldn't have to come to me every time you need to know the will of God. There's some things that people go, I'm not trying to diss pastors now. There's some things that people say, well, you know, I need to pass this by my pastor or whatever. Okay, cool. But I'm talking about every day, driving along slow. Amen. How do you depend so much on what your pastor says God's will is? You're not supposed to have to depend on that. You get up in the morning, God ought to be talking to you. You lay down at night, God ought to be talking to you. You walking through the day, God ought to be talking to you. You shouldn't just be talking to him, he ought to be talking to you too. Hello. Hello. I know I'm getting in trouble, but I'm out there now. Huh? We have put too much power in preacher's hands. Huh? All y'all preachers from all over the place. Glory to God. Amen. I teach you, I've taught you all for years. You're not God. You're not supposed to be God in the lives of his people. Let God be God. Let God be God. Don't you try to take his place. Teach the people how to hear from God for themselves. Come on, somebody. Teach them how to hear from God. And, and let me tell you something. If you ever want to lose your value in the kingdom of God, you start pointing the people to you. You don't point people to you. You point the people to their God. Are you hearing me? You don't make an idol out of yourself. We are so learned. I got a lot of revelation. Don't nobody have to tell me, glory to God, Dr. Banks, boy, I tell you, Dr. Banks, you got some revelation. God really give you revelation. I already know that. 
I don't need, I don't have to be humored. I don't have to be exalted. I don't have to be, I don't have to, you don't have to put me on any pedestals. Glory to God. I refuse to be worshipped. Nobody's going to worship me. Because the moment you put me up on that pedestal, God going to knock me down. So I'm not letting nobody build me up talking about, oh, you know, dock this and dock that. No, Jesus is what? Amen. Come on, Jesus is it. I need to hear Jesus. What is he doing? What is he doing in your life? Because when people start building up flesh, flesh likes to be built up. Flesh likes to be recognized and, and, and get all the accolades. and Yeah, and the flesh feel good, but honey, you better watch that. You ought to watch that when men keep patting you on the back, patting you on the back, and you start feeling good about it. Be careful. Don't take God's place in folks' lives. And because, because so many people have done that, so many preachers have done that, the people have built them up, built them up, and, and they continue to seize more and more control in the lives of God's people. And that, when, that, when that happens, when preachers seize that control in the lives of God's people, God's people become crippled. Anytime you can't hear from God for yourself, you are crippled. You are handicapped. Come on, y'all don't hear me now. See, I know this ain't a popular message, and some of these preachers may want me to turn, may turn me off and tell their preachers, don't listen to that. Tell them people, don't listen to that woman. Raise the Lord, but I'm preaching anyhow. Glory to God. When we, when we make the people feel that we're the only ones to hear from God, we got this direct line. We got this direct line to God, and, and anything they need to know, we can tell them. People come to me sometimes, I had a dream. Dr. Banks, I had a dream last night, and I dreamed this, 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 and that. And I, I'm not sure what it means. I said, go ask God. I don't have a gift of interpretation. See, preachers are scared to say, I don't have. But if you don't got it, you ain't got it. There's sometimes God will show me what a dream means. But that don't mean I got the gift like Joseph had. Joseph had the gift of interpretation. Daniel had the gift of interpretation. There are times when God will reveal some things to me through dreams and dreams of my own and dreams of other people. But that don't mean I got the gift that I can interpret everybody's dream. No, don't bring it to me. Take that. Go back to God. <laughs> Say, God, you, you gave me this dream. Now you tell me what it means. Because if God want to talk to you, if he talked to you in a dream, he can talk to you in person. Come on, somebody. Come on. How in the world God going to give you a dream and don't want you to understand it? What is that? If it came from God, he wants you to know it. But the reason why you don't never get it is because you don't go back to him and expect him to tell you what it means. Come on, you don't go back and expect a response from him. Are y'all hearing God? So we go and rely on other people. And when you go always relying on other people, guess what happened? You becoming crippled. Lame, crippled, and handicapped. Are you hearing God? Hallelujah. I'm in trouble, so I might as well go ahead on. There's you, Jesus. The purpose of fellowship. Notice what he said, that your joy would be full. It is not joyful when you can't hear from God. Isn't that right? The purpose of fellowship is to always know the Father's mind and heart in a matter. Anything that you get into... Anything that you have to deal with. The purpose of fellowshipping with God is so that you will always know what to do. You'll always know God's heart and God's mind in a situation. Why? Because you're fellowshipping with him. He'll tell you. It is to hear from, from the Lord so that we won't be perplexed or grievous. That's what fellowship does. It eliminates perplexity and grievousness. We get into situations and we're grieved because we're so perplexed, we don't know what to do. We don't know what, we don't know, we don't know what to do. We don't, just don't know how. We don't know how to move. We don't, we don't know anything. God says, uh-uh. Look at verse 5 here. 1 John 1 and 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is what? Light and in him is no darkness at all. I'm talking about fellowship. I'm talking about fellowship now. What does it mean to fellowship with him? It means he communicates, right? It means communication. Now this, this verse starts with this then, which means so, 
also or moreover. God is light and in him is no darkness. You know what John is trying to say? He's talked about fellowship. Then he goes and, and then he goes and say, you know, in him is light and there's no darkness at all in him. What is he saying? He's saying the reason that you can't fellowship with him is because he don't fellowship with darkness. H Hello? He's saying that he doesn't fellowship with darkness. People come to me sometimes and say, you know, Dr. Banks, God told me, and I start listening to him. God told me this, or God told me that. And I'm sitting there, I'm standing there, I'm trying not to be rude or anything, but I'm saying in my heart, God didn't tell him nothing. God didn't say nothing to that. The only thing God is going to say to this person is repent. You know, the particular person I'm talking to, I'm saying that this person is up to the eyeballs and sin. And if God, God's supposed to be showing them all this revelation of scripture and all this stuff, and they're up to the eyeballs and sin, and I'm sitting there saying, now God ain't said none to this person except repent. And they won't hear that. Repent. Because God doesn't fellowship with darkness. You're not going to make him fellowship with darkness. You're not going to force him to fellowship with darkness. He doesn't care if you bend over backwards. He doesn't care if you fast till your stomach goes to your backbone. He's not going to talk to you. He's not going to deal with you until you get the darkness out of you. He said, what fellowship does light have with darkness? What concord does Christ have with Baal? None. I don't fellowship with darkness. That's what the Lord said. Now you change me. I'm not changing. I am not changing. Get rid of the darkness. Get rid of, get rid of that stuff that's in the heart. Get rid of that, that shadow. People say, my heart is not dark. Well, a shadow is worse than the darkness. He said, if the light be in you, be dim. How great is that darkness? Because you know the truth. But there's a shadow in you. There's a shadow of turning. There's a shadow of turning. What is the shadow of a turning? We know the truth, but we're thinking about doing the opposite. To consider, to consider something that's not God's will is a shadow. Just to consider it. God said, get rid of the darkness. I am not communicating with the darkness. See, I, see what, I, what I'm trying to get us to do is let's deal with God where he is. See, God is saying, I'm not moving now. I'm not coming down where you at. You, you, you got to come to me now. I've, I've, I've already set the standard. I've been telling you this for years. Now come up to it or leave me alone. That's what he said. Come on up to it or just leave me alone. Because I'm not fellowshipping with that mess that's in you. Get the mess out you, because I'm not having no halfway church. I'm not, not, I'm not having no almost saint. Saint means sanctified. Holy. Holy. That's what I'm fellowshipping with. Holiness. I'm not sh fellowshipping with that, that, that stuff, that, you know, that iniquity that's in your heart. You think I don't see that? You think I don't know it? You think I don't know how you feel about sister so-and-so? You think I don't know what you're what you thinking in your heart about brother so-and-so? Hmm? Get rid of the darkness and I'll talk to you. I'll communicate with you. Change your ways. Change your ways. I don't like your ways. Your ways are wicked. Change your ways. Change your ways and I might talk to you. Change your ways because mine are not changing. You change yours, and we can talk. Oh, that's our God, saints. That's our God, Julia. He's not going to change. He said, I change not. I've already laid, I laid the groundwork, and I've set the standard. I raised it right here. Now you come up to it. I'm not coming down. I'm not pacifying. I'm not patting you on the back. I'm not telling you it's going to be all right because it's not going to be all right. You're either going to come to this standard, or you're going to leave me alone. How many say, God, help me? Come on, somebody ought to need to be crying out, God help me. We need to be crying out to the Lord. God help me. Help me get there, Lord. Help me. I want to get there. Help me. 
Anybody want to get there? Anybody want to be in real fellowship with God? Come on, saints. We need to be in real fellowship with him. Because there's some explosive stuff in this study guide, the rest of the conference, that we can't even get to until we get in fellowship. I want us to get in fellowship tonight. I want us to be in fellowship. I want us to get rid of all the mess. All of it. This time, get it all of it. We're not going to let anything, no darkness at all. Repent for what you was watching on TV. Repent for everything that you know is not God. Let's get rid of it. Turn away from it. This then is the message which we have heard of him. There's no darkness in him at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we do what? We lie. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we know that there's darkness in us and say that we don't have any sin in us, we lie, we deceive ourselves, and we don't do the truth. The truth is not in us. What is he saying? He's saying that if we know that there's something wrong and we don't admit it, we say we don't have any sin, knowing that we do have some darkness in us. People say, I know I'm just, I'm walking in holiness. I'm holy and glory to God. But you know you don't love people the way God loves people. You know there's some sharpness. You know that, 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 that you got some reservations, some holdbacks. You won't let Jesus be who he is in your body. No, you won't allow him. You won't allow Jesus, just, just give him full control. Just give him full control. You won't allow him. And you know it. Hello? All right, moving right along. Page four. Now watch this here. I'm going to tell you something here. I want you to learn this here. At the bottom of page three. Look at the bottom of page three. three. Here's where the rubber meets the road. Many saints deceive themselves by declaring themselves to be without sin simply because they don't commit the big eyebrow-raising sins. But if the heart is not in agreement with anything that is the mind of God, then fellowship is broken and darkness prevails in your soul. If you are not in agreement with anything that is the heart and mind of God, then darkness is in your soul. Those who are in fellowship with God are not walking the earth as blind sheep, fearful, and afraid of the gods of this world. We are not fearful and afraid of these demons running around here. We don't walk in fear. Hello? When every situation in which you are able, which you are not able to control, every situation that you are not able to control brings about fear. Listen to me really good here. This is something the Lord said to me. I was sitting to the computer and the Lord said this to me. He said, every situation in which you are not able to control, when that situation brings about fear, and every circumstance that places your desire to do the work of God seemingly out of reach, when that situation brings despair, then you are not in fellowship with God. When you want to serve the Lord, and the situation, there's maybe a, some circumstances that hinder you from doing the will of God and you move into despair, you're not in fellowship. When you get into a situation that you can't control and it brings about fear of, you know, I'm not talking, about, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You're not in fellowship. When godly decisions, I'm talking about our everyday life. When godly decisions are laced with mental anguish and the fear of threatening consequences, one is truly walking in darkness. When you have to make a godly decision, when you have to choose to 
obey God rather than go the route of the world. And, and that choice gives you mental anguish and fear. You're not in fellowship with God. Because if you were in fellowship with God, you would gladly obey him and suffer the consequences. You say, you know, they have a thing in the world, ride or die. We would be a ride or die with God. Whatever happened just have to happen because, amen, I'm going with God. But when that's not the case, and we have a lot of mental anguish and fear of obe obeying God causes us mental anguish, then we're not in fellowship. We're not in fellowship. Are y'all hearing me? This kind of fear is ungodly. This kind of fear is ungodly. When you fear doing the righteous thing, there are people that get caught up in sin, right? A man may get caught up in sin, a woman may get caught up in sin, some kind of sin. And because that person gets caught, in, caught up in sin, and if that person repents, even though that person repents, people don't want to deal with them. They don't want to be associated with them. Even though the person repents. I've never been like that. I, I, I see that as the biggest hypocrite it is. I've never been like that. If a person repent, I'm not worried about associating with them. Because I might get in sin next week and repent. I don't want the body of Christ to kick me out. Hello? Are y'all hearing God? I'm talking about a repentant heart. I'm not talking about somebody that's sin is arrogant inside of it. But I'm talking about a repentant heart. And some people don't want to be associated with it because everybody knows about the sin. So I don't want to be affiliated with that. I don't want to be associated with that. That's fear. That's the wrong kind of fear. That will lay you in hell. But that stops the flow of love. Doesn't allow the spirit of God to operate. It's ungodly. Fellowship is the platform on which God speaks to his people. Hello? Fellowship. You want God to speak to you? He's going to speak to you if, if you are in fellowship with him. That's his platform. His platform is fellowship. Without fellowship, there's no hearing from the Father for leadership or guidance of any kind. Without fellowship, God's not talking to you. You're not leading and guiding. Fellowship is the platform for God to speak to you. So if you want God to speak to you, get in fellowship with him. He loves it too. The greatest thing that ever happened to me is when I got here in Jamaica. God brought me here, set me up on a hill somewhere. And I sit there and just listen to God. Listen to what God is saying. I just listen to God. Listen to God. He and I talking back and forth, back and forth. You'll hear some of the things that he said in the study guide tomorrow. The Lord communicated with the disciples. Oh, wait a minute. Watch this. this I definitely want to deal here because we, we don't want the devil to get no advantage. It is true that the word of God is his written will. People say, well, the word of God is God's will. However, there are times and situations that are not explicitly written in the scriptures to indicate what we are to do or where we are to go. Is that true? It is in these times that the Father's will is made known to us through fellowship. Uh -huh. are, you, are you understanding that? Fellowship. Watch this. The Lord communicated with the apostles after he went back to glory. He did, he did so in dreams, visions, and a spoken word to their spirit. Will he not do the same with us? Will he not do the same with us? It is so hard to believe, or is it so hard to believe, that the Father is not a respecter of persons. We're all his children. By the same spirit, we all cry of a father. So let's cut to the chase here now. Holiness is the criteria for fellowship. Hello? 
Without holiness, you can't ever fellowship with God. But sin and unbelief have destroyed communications with God. Sin and unbelief. So if God's not talking to you, if he's not fellowshipping with you, it's either because you're in sin or because you don't believe him. God hate unbelief because you don't have any reason not to believe him. He's got you full of the Holy Ghost. My God, that's the witness on the inside. You don't have any reason not to believe God. Are you hearing? It's an insult not to believe God. Is it so hard to believe that he's not a respect of a persons? We are all his children, right? Now watch this here. It is a cursed generation that cannot hear from their father. Are y'all hearing God? It's a cursed generation that cannot commune with their own God. The God that has promised them that he would lead and guide them. And his own children cannot communicate with him. He is not speaking to them. He's got a problem with you. If God is not speaking to you, he has a problem with you. You have not given him a platform of fellowship. You have not given him the platform to talk to him, to, for him to talk to you. Are you hearing me? Now, in my closing, <clears throat> Jeremiah, glory, Jeremiah is the prophet that is our schoolmaster. The Lord took me to this. He said, he said, go here and use this as the schoolmaster so they can understand my mind. Jeremiah 42, verse 7 to 22. And it came to pass after 10 days that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Now, during this time, let's just to set, set the stage. During this time, this was a time when, the, when God had stirred up Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to come and attack Israel, come and take the children of Israel captive come and laid siege to the city and took the children of Israel captive back into Babylon. And he was coming. And he had come, and there was some, uh, Israel still had a few armies, you know, had, a few, had some armies and a couple of captains still around and leading some, some uh, soldiers. And they, uh, they were in a twix in between because they could not, they didn't have enough to really win the war against Nebuchadnezzar. They knew it, they had been defeated, they didn't have enough to win the war. So they didn't know whether to sur surrender or keep fighting or what, you know? So they said, they told, ne told uh, Jeremiah, you go talk to God for us and see what he say. Hello, you ever got into a, a, sit a bad situation between a rock and a hard place, and you know that the only hope is to talk to God, to get God to respond. You ever been there? That's what these people were. They needed to hear from God. So it came to pass after 10 days, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. It took him 10 days to get an answer back from God. Then called he Johan, the son of Kariah, Korea, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people from the least even to the greatest, and said unto them, now listen to this, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom ye sent me, you sent me to present your supplication before him. If ye will still abide in this land, talking about in Babylon, then I will build you. If you'll stay in Babylon, I'll build you. And will, pull, and will not pull you down. And I will plant you 
and not pluck you up. For I repent of the evil that I have done unto you. In other words, God is saying, stay in captivity. Stay in, stay in um, Babylon. He had ordained for Israel to be there 70 years. Stay there, and I'll build you right there. And I won't pull you down. And I won't allow you to be plucked up. Listen to him. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon. Don't be afraid of him. Of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, said the Lord, for I am with you to save you. I'm with you. It doesn't matter. I don't care nothing about King, King Nebuchadnezzar. I don't care nothing about the king of Babylon. I'm with you. I raise him up. I tear him down. I'm the one that instructs him because he's going to find out before it's over with that I rule in the kingdom of men. Hello, after he cropped grass for seven years. Hello, are y'all hearing God? Don't be afraid of this king. Whether it's Nebuchadnezzar, whether it's his great-grandson, whether it's Darius, the Persian king, don't be afraid of none of them. Because I'm with you to save you. Are you hearing him? I'm with you to save you. Hallelujah. And to deliver you from sin. The day is going to come when I will deliver you. I'll bring you out. But notice what he said to him. If you go, I'll build you there. And I'll, I'll, I will build you and I will not pluck you up. I will not tear you down. I won't pull you down. But if you say, if you say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God. Oh, wait a minute. Look at verse 12. I'm sorry, I skipped a verse. And I will show you mercies unto you. I will show mercies unto you that he may have mercy on you. I'll make your enemy have mercy on you. Look at God. And cause you to return to your own land. You see, there are times when God, I have been in, the, in um, had to be linked up with with people that I know of my enemy. And uh, know that they didn't mean me any good. And God said, I, 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 you know, I want to get out of this situation. I know they don't mean me any good. But God says, stay. Because I got reason for you there. He says, stay. So, okay, God, I'm going to stay. And if I stay and obey God, I reap the blessings of God. I have re that has happened to me so many times. I have reaped the blessings of God because I didn't respond to flesh. I didn't respond to flesh. You know flesh will cause you to miss your reward in heaven? You follow people saying, you need, no, no, no. Well, then when are we going to, if we can't bear, if we can't bear something, if we can't bear people, we're always trying to duck and dodge people. What, what, what do, are we going to be rewarded for? We want a, a flower bed of ease. We don't want anybody to agitate us. Hello? Stay in a thing till God gets you out of it. Hello? It may not be comfortable. Glory to God. I remember saying to, 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 to this set of bishops here, this, I said, you're in this situation. You know, they wanted to move out, especially then right there, the wife. Well, I got to get out of it. We got to get out. I ain't going back. I, I can't do this. I, I, oh, it's just, it's just hard. <laughs> it's so hard. It just hurts so hurtful. It's just so hurtful. I said, baby, you stay right there. Everything you say is the truth. Yeah, they're doing all kind of stuff to you, but you're going to stay right there. And you too. Both of you are going to sit right there. Till there's nothing in you. You can't get up and go with something in you. You can't get up and go with that hurt. You're going to build a ministry with hurt in you? Running away from hurt? 
No, you're going to stay there until you don't hurt no more. Come on, somebody. You're going to stay there until it roll off you like water off a duck's back. Because until you do that, you don't have nothing to preach. What you going to preach to other people? No, you're going to stay right there. Did you not stay there? Did you have to stay there? Glory to God. You're not going to sidestep and, 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 you know, and the, the, you know this, this is my oldest son here. Glory to God. And this is my daughter. Glory to God. These are my oldest children. I'm messing with my children. Praise you, Jesus. But they're God's children first. They're God's children. They got to learn how to walk in God. They got to learn how to walk in God. And I'm very close to them. These are my spiritual children. Glory to God. But, and I had the authority to say, come on out then. Come on out and go over here and do this. But I said, no, you stay. Because you got some stuff in you that need to come out. You can't, you can't operate with that hurt. You got you to make sure that, that, that the devil has nothing in you. That you can love in spite of. You got to learn how to love in the midst of the hurt. Hallelujah. In the midst of people trying to do you wrong. Hallelujah. Are y'all hearing God? Praise the Lord. So God will put you in a situation and say, stay there. Stay right there. Well, this is so hard. I mean, I've never had to deal with this kind of thing before. I mean, this is just so, so difficult, uh, Dr. Banks. This is just so hard. I've never had to deal with things like this. I mean, you know, and I know that there's times when I would have just gone. I would have just up and just gone. And I said, babe. <laughs> Stay right there. If you can't pass this test, what you got to say to people? You're a minister. How can you not sit here? You sit here. You take the table. You're a minister. You don't have nothing to minister if you have no become nothing. Hello? God says, stay there. He told him to stay. Glory to God. He said, my now, if you say you're not going to stay, huh? he said, but if you say you're not going to dwell in this land, neither will you obey the voice of your God, saying, look, look, I want you to underline this verse. Underline it, highlight it, highlight this verse. Don't you ever forget it. We're talking about losing fellowship with God, what it takes. If you say now, if you will not obey the voice of your God, saying, no, but we will go into the land of Egypt. We're getting out of here, and we're going to escape to Egypt, where we will see no war. In other words, I'm getting out of this situation so I can have some peace. You ever been there? I need to get out of this here so I can have some peace. I need some peace. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm going into Egypt where we will see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. He said, if you say that, oh, you go into the land where you can prosper. You don't have to worry about no, no, no adversity. Uh-huh, you want to get out of this situation, get, you know, hallelujah. The, Is the Israelites went into Babylon as an oppressed people. It was God's will for them to serve the Babylonians. Listen to this. Nevertheless, well, God told them to serve the Babylonians for 70 years. Nevertheless, the promise of the Lord was that there would be safety in their servitude. See, when you obey God and do what God tell you to do, serve where God tell you to serve. Serve where he tell you to serve. Stop jumping around here and there and over yonder. Stand still where God plants you at. God said, if you stay there, I'll build you. 
I'll build you and I won't pull you down and I won't pluck you up. I'll bless you and I'll have mercy on you and I'll make your enemies have mercy. Come on, somebody. If you just stay where I tell you to stay. I'm not, are you, are you, you the one, you worried about adversity? I control the adversity. I control your enemy. I've got control of your enemies. Come on, somebody. Because it was the will of God for them to be in such a place, he would protect them there. Not only so, but he would also bring them into their own land at an appointed time. There's a time appointed for God to move you someplace. It's a time appointed for God to do. And, and all this here, people, people, when they get offended, that, well, the Lord has said for me to move on. The Lord has appointed this time for me to go on into another direction. You just offend it. And you don't want to deal with adversity. You don't want to deal with it God's way. Come on, saints. You have no fellowship with God. He's not telling you to do anything. Many saints are ignorant of the will of God for their lives because at some point they strayed from the course he set them on. Many were like un the unconverted Peter. They really believe they will never abandon the Lord nor his way. How many believe that? I won't abandon God. I won't abandon his way. They believe that they will never abandon the Lord nor his way until either a grievous circumstance or a prospect of need arises. Sometimes we think that we'll just follow God and we'll just, we'll just do anything God wants us to do until some grievous circumstances come up. Or the prospect of a grievous circumstance come up. Don't have to be the circumstance, just the prospect. It just looks like something bad going to happen. Hello. Hallelujah. It is here that faith and trust vanishes. When people, glory to God, get afraid, their faith and their trust in God vanishes. Peter did not agree with the route God set for Jesus. He did not understand that suffering always precedes glory. Hello? Suffering always precedes glory. Jesus learned obedience to the Father by what? The things he suffered. It might have been rugged and hard, but it was the will of God. Look at verse 14 again, saying, no, but we will. That's the verse God wants us to highlight tonight. He's saying, if you could just overcome this, you could have fellowship with me. Saying, no, but we will. Most saints do not see their refusal to walk in the place where they must endure hardness as the act of saying no to God. When you refuse to walk in a difficult situation that God has placed you in, things are hard, things are difficult. People may be talking about you. People may not like you. You may have enemies on every hand. Glory to God. But if it's the will of God for you to walk through that, hallelujah. You don't think that enduring that or refusing to endure that is an act of saying no. I won't do that. I will do this. You're choosing your own right route now. You're choosing your own guidance. God can't guide you because you're saying no to the route that he's putting you on. Are you hearing God? But we are saying no, but we are saying no when we look for an alternative place to settle, a comfortable, non-threatening zone. Hello? Some of us are missing God because we're looking for a comfort, comfort zone, something that doesn't threaten what we're what we trying to do, something that doesn't threaten our little empires that we're building for ourselves, something that... that that, that uh, doesn't infringe upon our time that we want to devote to other things. Hallelujah. <laughs> Bless the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> we want a comfort zone where we, there won't be any war, any adversity, nor hunger for bread, a place of prosperity. We're more comfortable making money or being in a position to make money, or being in a position where, you know, I just, I, I, you know, this ministry stuff is all right, but, you know, God ain't made no fools now. 
I got to take care of myself and glory to God. And sometimes we're more comfortable, amen, just working secular and, and put God's ministry on hold. Hello, and I'm not saying for everybody to go quit their job. That's not what I'm saying, because I got to have some tithe. Praise the Lord. We don't have no tithe. We can't pay the bills in the church. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about, amen, when we would prefer to work, to do, we'll, we'll work on our job like maggots. Oh, we'll work, we'll work, we'll work, we'll work, because we're going we to get some money. At the end of the, the week or the day or whatever, we're gonna, we will have made some. We can see the benefits of that. We see the prosperity, and we don't see no benefits in just putting a lot of energy like that into God. We'll spend money on everything but God. God sees that, and that's why we don't have fellowship with him. We'll give thousands of dollars to something we want. We'll go out and buy a flat screen television and pay thousands of dollars for it, amen, and won't put half of that in the ministry. That's just too much. That's just too much. Don't you know that that hinders your fellowship with God? Because God knows that you're holding back on him and you're satisfying your own lusts. Come on, somebody. Are y'all hearing me? Glory to God. However, the Lord's response to this behavior, what is his response? These saints believe that they're doing that which is in their best interest. But God's response is not good for them at all. In essence, they, are, they have usurped authority, their own will over his will. They have not regarded his desire for their lives and have gone about to establish their own. Just as the Jews said to God, we will, so has the body of Christ said the same. Many have walked in their own will with very little regard for the will of God. The bottom line here is that many do not hear the voice of God because their own will stands between him and them. You don't hear the will of God because your will stands between you and him. You got your will in the way. Are y'all hearing God? In cons some in the body have made a resolve in their spirit. Listen to this. This is Caribbean conference. Shake yourself. We need to hear. You say you want to hear God, didn't you? Well, he's talking right now. Some in the body have made a resolve in their spirit that no one is going to lead them outside of their comfort zone. There's some people that have decided you're not going to take me out of my comfort zone. I don't care who, who you are. You could be the apostle. You can be the archbishop. You can be whoever. You're not leading me outside of my comfort zone. This includes the spiritual government in the body as well as the Holy Ghost himself. The Holy Ghost trying to lead you and guide you, but if he's trying to lead you out of your comfort zone or out of your place of prosperity, you're not going with him. You're always putting him on hold. He's always on hold. He's always on hold. He's always second on the list, third on the list. His, his agenda is always somewhere else. You have your own agenda. You got to fulfill your own agenda first. And you think to have fellowship with God, you have no fellowship with God. And people like that, they don't have fellowship with God, and then all of a sudden they want to go on a fast. All of a sudden they want to go on a sabbatical. You're not hearing from him then. Because you done put God way over here somewhere. Do all of, the, all of the month, don't do anything he tell you to do, and then suddenly now, at the end of the month, at the end of six months from, you know, for the year end, I, I need to, maybe I need to go fellowship with the Lord. God doesn't play that game, saints. He doesn't play that game. Are you hearing God? Hallelujah. Although they might seem to be some of the most loyal and virtuous individuals in the ministry. Their variance to spiritual authority is not visible until the Holy Ghost makes a demand of them that takes the soul out of the place of comfort and control. People like to control. They like to, they like to keep themselves in, under control, you know, control their, their doings and, and their goings. They don't want God to control Nothing they do. 
They don't want to be under God's control. They want to control themselves. I don't want to, I don't want that. I don't want to control myself, my own life. I want God to control it. I want God to control it. He can do a better job than me. In considering the schoolmaster for this principle, Jeremiah the prophet inquired of God as to where the people were to go. And you know, you know, they said that they was gonna go, but then they didn't go. They didn't do, they didn't do what God said do. They didn't stay in the land like God say. They didn't, they didn't, they just didn't obey. They didn't obey. Now watch this. They said, no, we will do this or that. No, but we will go here or we will go there. Now, I want to read something to you on page six for you to take with you. Um, I got about, what, five minutes? Or do I have that long? Cue me up. Praise the Lord. I, I may not be able to finish this. I can't see that. Okay, I'm going to read this, and you decide where you, where you are. In some cases, the Father has had such people under observation for years, people that are just like these folks. When God tell them to go, they don't go. When God tell them to stay, they don't stay. Whatever God say, they do just the opposite because they're inside of their own will. In some cases, listen to this very carefully. God has had such people under observation for years. They seem to be loyal and dedicated to the will of God for their ministries and to their ministries. They're not lazy nor slothful. In fact, many are very hard workers, but they are also idol worshipers. They are good at what they do, but they are only good because they're doing it their way and in their timing. They are will worshipers. They worship their own will. Therefore, they have no problem saying to their leaders or to the Holy Ghost, no, but I will do this or that. I won't do what you want me to do, but I'll do this. I'll do that. I won't go where you want me to go, but I'll go here. I'll go there. These sons have violated the most sacred of laws. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Their will is their God. That's why they don't know the will of God. Because their own will is their God. Their will has taken the place of his. They are usurpers. The scripture has said, For it is God which worketh in us both to do to will and to do of his good pleasure. Didn't I say that? The work should be that which God has chosen to do through us. Any work we're doing, it should be the work that God has chosen to do through us. Not something that we chose to do for him. But what he has chosen to do through us. And sometimes we, we pick and choose what we want to do. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna decide what it is we want to do. But God said, that's not what I want to do through you. You do what I want to do through you. You let me do what I want to do through you. Not you do what you want to do for me. You're going you're gonna to sell yourself to me. No, 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 no. This is my, it's my will. I am the one that wills and does through you. Do you understand that? I, want, I am the one that will and does through you. You don't decide what it is you're going to do in my body. Are you hearing God? I make that decision. I'm, I, it's my will and it's my doings, not yours. Do you hear God? Amen. Hallelujah. Thus, the will and the work should be a manifestation of God in us. That's when people see God, when we allow God to will and do through us. See, if, if, God, if we allow God to will and do through us, we will always know his will. You'll always know, and you'll be a witness to what he's doing. If you obey, 
God renders a promise to make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and honor forever. God works in us through Jesus Christ, who is the new man dwelling in our flesh, fleshy bodies. Now, I want to ask you, I, wanna, I want you to ask yourself, am I infringing upon the will of God? Am I in the middle of this message? Is God talking to me? Because see, if we decide to, 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 if we make a decision tonight and say, God, I am so guilty of not fellowshipping with you because I have not allowed you to will and do through me. I've been doing my own thing. I've been deciding what I'm going to do, when I'm going to do it, how I'm going to do it, and if I'm going to do it. But I'm ready tonight to give over to you. I'm ready tonight to surrender because I want to hear from you the rest of this weekend and the rest of my life. I want to be in fellowship with you. I want to be in fellowship with you. And God is saying to you and those of you that are watching by way of television, if you have not allowed the will of God to work through you so that you will always know his will, if you have not allowed the fellowship of God, you're not standing on a platform, God say, come and get it straight with me tonight. Surrender. That's what he wants tonight. He wants those to come that are willing to surrender their will to him, to give him their will. Don't come to this altar unless you're willing to give God your will and say, God, you can take it all. I don't want no part of, I don't want to make any decisions on my own. You can take it. Have, take charge of this vessel. Tell me what you want me to do. Show me what you want me to do. Lead me. Guide me. I'm tired of my own will. I'm tired of my own way. Lord, take control. If that's what God is saying to you tonight, then you come and give it to him. You come and surrender. You come to this altar and say, God, I don't want nothing else. I want this. I want, I, I want a change in this conference. I want this conference to be a change in my life. I, I want this to be different. I want to leave here different. And it doesn't matter what your title is. If you know God talking to you, then you get to this altar. Someone bring a chair for Miss Dusty, please. Bring her chair.